the armor. Hi, this is Michelle Davis. I'm the executive director of the International FOP Association. We are thrilled that you can be with us today on this webinar. We're hosting a webinar in honor of rare disease today, which is actually tomorrow, uh, leap day, the most unique special day of the year. We hope that you've been following us on social media this week, whether it be on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We've been posting rare disease facts all week and sharing how those relate to FOP. So if you haven't checked that out, I hope that you will take a moment to do that and reshare some of those rare disease facts. We are thrilled today to have Adam Sherman with us, um, who will be sharing with us about how the IFOPA <clears throat> is advancing FOP research. Before we get started, I do want to share just a couple of housekeeping rules um, so that we can minimize background noise. All attendees are muted. And so if you have a question, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. You can click on that to submit a question. There is also a chat button. You can send a chat to the panelists. And then at the end of the call, I will um, go through those questions and we'll have Adam answer those questions for you. So that's the best way uh, to submit questions on the call. So Adam Sherman has been with the IFOPA since early 2017. And in that time, due to incredible support from our donors, uh, the incredible partnership of researchers and clinicians, we have been in a position to really grow the work that the IFOPA is doing in research. So we're excited today for the opportunity for you to see and hear about all of the variety of things that the IFOPA is doing. We do still um, fund an incredible amount of research at the University of Pennsylvania, but there is a lot of other things that we are doing that helps advance our mission and our vision to cure FOP. So with that, I'll turn it over to Adam. Thank you, Michelle. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Adam Sherman, and I'm the research director for the IFOPA. Uh, I'd like to first uh, also wish you a very happy Rare Disease Day. As uh, Michelle mentioned, technically uh, uh, Rare Disease Day is tomorrow, since we have a, a leap year uh, in 2020. Um, 20, but nevertheless, I'd like to uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedules to uh, listen to this uh, webinar. Uh, just one other uh, quick note um, that we are recording this webinar uh, so that people who are unable to listen in today will have the opportunity to uh, hear this talk in the future. Uh, also, as uh, Michelle mentioned, uh, we do have that Q&A uh, button. Uh, please, please uh, make this uh, webinar a little interactive and submit us your questions uh, so that way it's just not uh, me speaking uh, the whole time. And as Michelle mentioned, we'll address your questions at the uh, end of uh, this talk. So um, <clears throat> we will be showing a little bit of information, not too much, but a little bit of information on clinical trials and FOP. So I just wanted to share with you a quick uh, disclaimer, which I think is important. Um, the IFOPA does not endorse nor recommend specific clinical trials. Um, please uh, speak with your doctor if you're interested in participating in a clinical trial. So given it's a uh, rare disease day, I thought I'd briefly share with you some statistics about rare diseases, which I uh, found pretty interesting. Uh, a rare disease is currently defined in the U.S. as having a prevalence of less than 200,000 uh, individuals. Uh, this definition does vary country by country and also by region, but this is a, a pretty good uh, general metric to use to define a rare disease. Uh, today, there are approximately 7,000 different rare disease, uh, diseases currently known. But there are probably more than 7,000 as many diseases are still being documented. And while each disease is relatively rare, collectively uh, rare diseases are actually quite common, affecting almost one in 10 individuals. Uh, this translates into approximately 30 million people in the US and over 700 million people around the world having a rare disease, uh, which is a pretty remarkable statistic when you think about it. 
The unfortunate news is that today, only 5% of rare diseases have an improved treatment. However, the good news is that more and more research dollars is being spent in rare diseases. Uh, currently, there are 560 um, uh, clinical trials for a variety of different rare diseases, and I expect this uh, trend to only continue. So I'm a, a, a self-proclaimed uh, nerd. I'm a little bit nerdy, and I like to tend to uh, uh, look at graphs and charts. And this chart, although not the clearest, uh, really spoke to me, and I, I guess also confirms that uh, I am a bit of a nerd. Um, just to walk you through it, the solid uh, or, or blue mountain that you can uh, see on my screen uh, here shows how much money is being spent in drug research and development over time. As you can see, since the 1980s, the amount of R&D spend for new treatments has increased pretty dramatically uh, over time, uh, reaching about $50 billion per year starting around uh, 2005, 2006. Um, by 2016, the last data point that we have, nearly $60 billion was spent in research and development. That's a lot of money. Uh, but when you look at the thin blue line that's going across, uh, which represents new drugs that are approved, um, you can actually see that the number of new drugs is not going up at the same rate as the R&D spent. Um, in fact, it seems like we hit a plateau back, I would say, in the 1990s in terms of new drugs getting approved. Now, there are several reasons uh, for, for this, and keep in mind, this is all uh, diseases and not just uh, 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 R&D uh, spent on rare diseases. But the key takeaway, at least for myself, is that you need to be careful on how you spend your research dollars. Uh, pouring money into research does not necessarily translate into more treatments. You need to be strategic. And that brings us back to FOP and, and, and the, the concept for this uh, talk. Um, recognizing that we uh, need to be strategic with our uh, very limited resources, the IFOPA set off to create a research strategy back in uh, 2017 to guide our research efforts. And as you can see on the top, this was a three-year strategy to really help us prioritize where we spend our resources. And we broke out our strategy into four main groups or buckets. Uh, that is basic research, uh, or that's the same way of saying really early stage research, uh, drug discovery, clinical trials, and also clinical care. Uh, the first is uh, basic research. And here we feel it's important to fund research that identifies uh, disease pathways for future uh, drugs. And to steal a very good analogy from uh, Dr. Fred Kaplan at the University of Pennsylvania, we want to support research that paints a bullseye on potential areas where new drugs can be developed. The second focus for the IPOPA is drug discovery. Here we want to invest in research that directly develops new approaches to treating FOP. Uh, we ultimately, and sorry to use uh, a soccer phrase, we want as many shots on goal as possible for new treatments in FOP. Our third uh, uh, area uh, of focus uh, is clinical trials. And this doesn't mean the IFOPA is actually conducting clinical trials. Uh, what this is really signifying here is this is about investments that help study sponsors design uh, trials better use the fewest FOP participants in those clinical trials, and we want to help to get answers about good drugs or drugs that do not work in the shortest duration possible. And that's kind of our role here in that uh, third bucket. And finally, we have clinical care. Uh, we support efforts to help with early diagnosis and achieving optimal clinical care for those living with FOP. And we went through our research strategy process and we started to map out those uh, four main areas. And uh, we went through and we figured out what was the most important areas to spend our research efforts on. And we also tried to identify where there are research gaps. Although this, is, uh, this strategy is now two years old and I guess uh, it's actually a little over two years. 
it still guides us today in areas where we spend our resources and focuses, uh, including things like muscle biology, immunology, biomarkers, surgery, as well as uh, finding new treatment approaches to uh, 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 treating and eventually curing FOP. So the IFOPA, believe it or not, does not have any research labs, uh, uh, nor do we have teams of researchers uh, focused on conducting FOP research. So how we accomplish our research goals is really the key to success. And we do this in four main uh, ways. Uh, first, we collaborate with researchers and we bring researchers uh, together to uh, tackle very specific problems in FOP. We develop and make available research tools uh, that lower the barriers to conducting research and also helps researchers to de-risk the science. Uh, third, uh, we provide research uh, funding uh, to experts to conduct research, um, covering everything from very early research to developing new treatments uh, for FOP. And then uh, finally, we partner with uh, drug development experts, uh, usually biotech and pharmaceutical companies, who really know and are uh, experienced in bringing uh, forward new treatments through clinical trials, and importantly, they also know how to work with the regulators like FDA, EMEA, uh, to gain approval for these uh, medicines. And we do all these efforts really for one reason and one reason only, and that is to live up to our mission to fund research to find a cure for FOP. So now uh, I'm gonna speak about kind of the first bucket or pillar of our research strategy, which is around FOP collaborations and connectivity. And one of the more important meetings that the IFOPA supports is our Drug Development Forum, or DDF. Uh, we just completed our fourth FOP DDF meeting late last year in Orlando, Florida. And the IFOPA organizes this uh, biannual scientific meeting, uh, which attracts researchers from all over the world. Uh, this past uh, year, we had about 160 people from uh, 20 different countries attend this two-day meeting, uh, which was really uh, truly remarkable to see. But what I think is uh, really unique here is the variety of stakeholders that come together to have this focused uh, discussion on FOP. Uh, we had FOP clinicians, academic researchers, biotech and pharmaceutical representatives, and members of the FOP community, again, solely focused on just FOP. Uh, we even had a member of FDA participate in our uh, last DDF, uh, which is really a great experience uh, for all of us. And I think it made it uh, for a more well-rounded uh, meeting. So uh, over these uh, two days, uh, we had over 35 presentations on FOP in uh, two panel sessions. But as you can see uh, from the quote on the bottom of your screen, uh, the DDF is really more than a meeting uh, to hear about the latest uh, research in FOP. Uh, the DDF is also, and importantly, an opportunity to connect researchers to help build and foster important research connections. And, and that's a key, uh, really, to our DDF uh, meeting. Now, just to highlight two other points of uh, connectivity that the IFOPA uh, was involved in, uh, first was uh, an FOP immunology workshop. And so we know that people's immune system uh, does play a role in FOP, uh, but there's really never been a, a deep dive in, in terms of what we know in this area. Uh, so the IFOPA uh, teamed up with uh, Dr. Eileen Shore, uh, also uh, Dr. Uh, Fred Kaplan from the University of Pennsylvania to hold this meeting to discuss FOP immunology. Uh, during this meeting, uh, we had 18 researchers attend this uh, full day meeting. And the real interesting thing about this meeting is that we also invited both FOP experts, but also immunologists who had uh, relatively little knowledge about FOP. Uh, one of the immunologists who really didn't know much about FOP ended up uh, submitting a uh, grant request after the meeting. 
and is now studying FOP immunology at his university. We also had, uh, as a follow-up, uh, two other researchers uh, spent grants uh, and are now studying um, immunology and FOP, so a great outcome. Uh, the next collaboration I just wanted to briefly highlight is our FOP Biomarker Consortium. And for those of you who don't know, uh, briefly, biomarkers are just really uh, measures, uh, bio, uh, uh, biological measures that reflect the state of your body. Uh, these markers can go up and they can go down. And they let you know certain things about a given disease. Uh, biomarkers can be very helpful not only to researchers and uh, at the research bench, but they're also helpful for clinical trial sponsors and, and uh, helping design clinical trials and running uh, clinical trials. And they're also helpful uh, to physicians. So given that we don't have a biomarker for FOP and given the overall importance of biomarkers, we formed uh, this uh, working group, this uh, FOP biomarker consortium. And this uh, consortium is comprised of academic and industry researchers. Uh, all with the goal of uh, identifying a new uh, biomarker for FOP. So again, just another great example of uh, the opportunity and, and ability for us to pull together researchers, to collaborate together, and to focus on common issues and uh, goals within FOP. Uh, just sorry about that. Uh, just want to highlight uh, some tools um, uh, that we support from the uh, IFOPA. Um, and our first tool um, that I want to uh, focus on is our FOP uh, mouse model. So when you have a investigational drug uh, that you might think uh, might work in a disease, whether it's for high blood pressure, um, diabetes, or FOP, uh, one of the things you'll eventually want to do is test that uh, potential medication uh, in animals. And more specifically, you want to test it in an animal model that is representative of that disease. Um, there are several FOP mouse models uh, that exist uh, today. However, uh, if you're a researcher that doesn't have an FOP mouse model, uh, gaining access to this tool can be quite lengthy and sometimes a little difficult. And this has uh, been raised uh, consistently by uh, members of the research community. And we were hearing this complaint enough uh, where the IFOPA decided to create and oversee the distribution of our own uh, FOP mice to ensure that these researchers are not impeded um, by this important uh, tool. Uh, our mice has the classic R206H mutation in FOP and expresses heterotopic or uh, bone growth in a similar way as to people with FOP. Uh, this allows researchers to study uh, ongoing FOP uh, biology and importing also to test uh, new potential uh, drugs for FOP. Uh, we're pretty excited uh, that the mice are now available and uh, they're also in use by researchers uh, around uh, the world. Uh, so just a uh, quick uh, shout out. Uh, so um, we uh, have access and researchers have access uh, to these mice um, as a result of uh, some great in-kind support that we've received from Dr. Daniel Perrin at Emory University. We're so grateful for his support. And um, we also received a uh, very generous uh, grant from a pharmaceutical company out in California called La Jolla Pharmaceuticals. And we're very fortunate to have both uh, help us get this mouse model up and running and available. So the uh, 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 another uh, research tool that the IFOP has developed is our FOP uh, biobank. Uh, a biobank is just a collection of biosamples that are stored for future research. Uh, people with FOP or their family members can donate, um, and you can see these icons here, uh, they can donate blood, uh, saliva, urine, or uh, teeth, kids' teeth that fall out, and you can donate these uh, directly to our IFOPA uh, biobank. And from your donations, uh, researchers from all over the world can study FOP in greater detail and even help us identify new biomarkers. Uh, so biobanks can be uh, critical tools uh, to studying rare diseases, 
And uh, biobanks are actually a great way for uh, you to directly participate in uh, research. If you are interested uh, in participating in our biobank, uh, either today, tomorrow, or in the future, please visit ifopa.org forward slash biobank, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you've already donated, uh, thank you. Uh, please know that you can also donate multiple times. In fact, repeat donations, meaning donating multiple times, is very valuable to our biobank. So we definitely encourage people who've already donated to donate again. Uh, again, um, we do everything uh, through collaboration uh, and we've received um, in-kind support from, uh, again, uh, Dr. Daniel Perrin, along with uh, Drs. Uh, Ed Chow at uh, UCSF, uh, also Eileen Shore at UPenn, and Dr. Bob Pignolo at uh, the Mayo Clinic. Uh, also, running a biobank is expensive, and we've taken on sponsors to help cover uh, the costs. And so I just want to uh, thank our uh, biobank sponsors, uh, Blueprint Medicines, uh, Ibsen, and Regeneron, for their very generous uh, support of this biobank. So a, a big uh, thank you uh, to our sponsors. So uh, this year, we'll be starting our preclinical drug testing program in collaboration with uh, Dr. Pignolo at uh, the Mayo Clinic. Um, often, it takes a lot of resources, uh, both money and people, to test drugs and animal models. Uh, it also takes a lot of time to run these tests, uh, especially if you don't have uh, our FOP mouse already in your lab. So the goal uh, with this program is really to lower the threshold for testing drugs that may work in FOP. Um, by lowering this threshold, we believe drug testing uh, program uh, that we're getting up and running will help accelerate the identification and development of new treatments for FOP. Uh, really to test a new uh, drug in our program, you only need a good idea with good scientific rationale, that's it. Uh, so we're pretty excited about this program, uh, which will start up later this year. And uh, please look for more information uh, from the IPOPA in the coming months. So uh, that's a, uh, a new program just starting this year. So the uh, last tool I'd like to uh, mention is our FOP registry. Uh, we spend a lot of time and resources to build and maintain this important asset uh, for the FOP community. Uh, registries can be a very powerful tool for rare diseases like uh, FOP, and it's something that we feel everyone with FOP can uh, contribute to. So I guess the first question we should answer is what exactly is a registry? A uh, registry is pretty straightforward, actually. Uh, it's just a collection of clinical and medical information about uh, people with a given disease uh, like FOP. Uh, no more, no less. Uh, but despite, despite its uh, simplicity, uh, registries are an important and impactful uh, tool that can be used to fight rare diseases. Um, in rare diseases like FOP, it's uh, often hard to understand how a disease impacts patients over time, especially since FOP impacts each person individually. Uh, you're all unique. Uh, by pulling all of your stories together in a registry, we gain a much clearer picture of FOP, and that's kind of the point. And by truly understanding how FOP affects you, everyone and everyone around the world, uh, we begin to know how to better manage your FOP. Uh, we begin to understand what symptoms you experience. We begin to understand how FOP changes over time. And eventually, we'll begin to understand how different medications may help you. So uh, ultimately, this information is uh, powerful and helps clinicians better manage your care. Uh, registries can help researchers to better conduct um, some of their experiments. And importantly, uh, registries can help drug companies uh, design better clinical trials. And uh, just this morning, our second manuscript on the FOP registry was published in a journal called Bone. Uh, if you email me at adam period sherman at ifopa.org, I'd be more than happy to send you a copy of our uh, uh, really hot off the press 
a manuscript about our registry, which we're uh, pretty excited about. So enrolling and participating in the registry is a pretty simple process uh, to register. Just go to fopregistry.com. Uh, Here's the uh, link right here on your screen and fill out some uh, pretty simple questions. Uh, once you're registered, uh, you'll need to complete the first baseline survey, which generally takes, I'm gonna say about 45 minutes or so. Uh, if you're a speed demon, um, I'm assuming you can complete it faster, but just plan on spending about 45 minutes for that uh, very first questionnaire. After this uh, step, you'll be asked to complete a survey every six months. And generally, these follow-up surveys go much quicker uh, in the range of, say, 20 to uh, 30 minutes or so. And that's pretty much it. I have uh, some great news for you. Uh, you can participate now in the registry through a, uh, a mobile app. Uh, which is currently available in the uh, Apple uh, App Store if you have an iPhone. And uh, later this year, uh, we'll have an app available for Android users. Um, so uh, you'll uh, need to uh, hear more information from the IPOPA when that's available. So uh, just one quick note, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention this. Uh, if you have uh, participated in Clementia's Natural History Study, uh, but you are not part of the registry, it is strongly encouraged that you just join a registry. By joining the registry, your valuable natural history data will be shared with the FOP registry if you consent. And by sharing it with the FOP registry, you are therefore sharing it with researchers around the world. So I just want to uh, mention one quick uh, perk for participating in the registry is that we are now offering a $25 Visa gift card for each survey that you complete. Uh, and this is just a uh, way for the IPOPA to say thank you for taking the time to contribute to our important registry and to uh, help the field move forward. So uh, we started the FOP registry in July of 2015. And as you can see, we're really off to a great start. Uh, participation in the uh, registry is growing significantly each and every year. As you can see on the left-hand side, um, this is number of participants over a uh, uh, year. We have, uh, as the end of 2019, a little over 300 people participating in our registry. And just to put this uh, number into perspective, that represents about 30% of all known people with FOP around the world. Uh, we have uh, translated our uh, registry into seven languages, and that would be um, English, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, uh, Russian, French, and German. I hope that's seven. And as a result uh, our of our translations, uh, we are now in 64 uh, countries around the world, which we're really proud of, and just shows you that we are a true uh, global study. So uh, just a, a quick word about uh, grant funding. As uh, Michelle mentioned, uh, we do provide uh, research funding to academic institutions to conduct uh, FOP research. And there's no university uh, the IFOPA has supported longer than the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, in fact, our collaboration started way back in the 1980s, uh, 89, I believe, uh, when our founder, Jeannie Pieper, uh, first started to work with uh, doctors uh, Michael Zaslaw and uh, doctors uh, Fred Kaplan. And today we continue to provide research funding to the Center for FOP Research at uh, UPenn. And uh, this uh, funding goes to uh, support everything from basic or early uh, uh, research uh, all the way through uh, translational research. And I'd just like to say, you know, uh, that this has been a, a really wonderful collaboration with UPenn. And uh, we uh, at the IFOK are very fortunate to have this important um, uh, partnership. So the IFOPA also uh, has established a competitive uh, grant program to award FOP investigators with uh, research funding. Uh, this is one of uh, my favorite programs at the IFOPA Sports. Uh, the, th this program was started um, four years ago as a way to support and enable the development of uh, new therapeutic approaches to treating uh, FOP. 
Uh, the name of this uh, FOP uh, um, grant program, as you can see at the uh, top, is uh, ACT for FOP. Uh, this ACT stands for Accelerating Cures and Treatments. Uh, I actually uh, like this acronym because I think it accurately uh, reflects uh, the purpose of this program. So we'll have uh, proposals uh, submitted from investigators all over the world to the ACT program. Uh, proposals are reviewed by an independent uh, scientific advisory board, which you can uh, see over here on the right. Uh, our, uh, these uh, advisory board members are, are blinded to the application, meaning that they don't know which investigator is submitting uh, which uh, application. And we do this just to ensure that funding decisions are solely based on the scientific merit, and that we're only funding the best research possible. So over the uh, past four years, uh, you can see that we've uh, funded um, uh, over $950,000 to FOP researchers. And uh, we have to uh, thank uh, not only support from the IFOPA, but also national organizations, FOP organizations that have contributed to this program. We're uh, uh, really grateful for their support. Uh, we receive uh, great uh, support from community fundraising efforts uh, like uh, Joshua's uh, um, um, uh, uh, Cure for uh, FOP, and then also uh, donations from individual uh, family members. So a big uh, thank you for all of our uh, members who have supported this program. And today uh, we have uh, generated a great portfolio of research that we support. Uh, we currently have funded uh, 18 uh, research grants at uh, 14 uh, different institutions, which you can see those in institutions uh, at, at uh, the, uh, the bottom here of the screen. And half of these grants, or nine, are looking at novel approaches uh, to treating FOP. And as mentioned, we have spent nearly $1 million, uh, about $960,000, uh, supporting these exciting research uh, programs. So here we have our uh, IFOPA uh, drug development chart. And just to familiarize yourself, uh, you can see that we have uh, drug candidates uh, going down uh, from top to bottom down on the rows. Uh, and you can see which stage of development each uh, candidate is at uh, during the development um, continuum. Uh, for example, uh, you can see that uh, seven uh, of, of these uh, drugs are currently in clinical development, which means that they're being tested in uh, people. Uh, I do have a late breaking kind of announcement uh, that the serocatinib uh, drug um, will start a clinical trial in the next two weeks. The name of the trial is called uh, STOPBOP. Uh, so please uh, stay tuned uh, for more information. Uh, if you'd like to uh, learn more about it, you can go to STOPBOP. Dot com. That's S-T-O-P-F-O-P dot com and learn more about it. Uh, but just also to highlight, we have uh, nine other uh, compounds that are at various stages of research. And I just uh, want to really point out these aspects that you see here um, uh, next to some of these compounds. These are uh, programs that we've uh, continued to invest in uh, through our ACT for FOP grant program. So you can see that uh, through our ACT for FOP grant program, we are uh, um, putting more treatments uh, into the pipeline. And we're gonna continue to invest in new treatments until we reach our goal of curing FOP. So the IFOPA also contributes to another grant program uh, sponsored by the uh, Penn Orphan Disease Center. Uh, the Million Dollar Bike Ride Program provides uh, matching funds for rare disease uh, research. So for uh, every dollar we contribute to the Orphan Disease Center, uh, the center matches our uh, money dollar for dollar. So this is really a great way uh, to amplify our research funds. Uh, we first started participating in this program uh, back in 2018 uh, and through uh, generous donations as well as uh, I'll say uh, passionate uh, cyclists. Uh, we've raised over $150,000 uh, for FOP research in just the past two years and uh, we've funded four research grants to date and we are planning to participate in this uh, program again uh, this year. 
So uh, the final pillar uh, that I'd like to talk about is uh, supporting uh, pharmaceutical and drug development efforts. Um, so the IFOPA will partner with any drug developer or sponsor that is uh, conducting ethical uh, research, uh, and that's according to international uh, regulatory and clinical uh, standards. And we help these companies by assisting them to organize uh, and also participate in uh, patient advisory boards. Uh, we'll provide direct input into their development programs and also bring community insights to help shape uh, some of their trials. And our interactions with the uh, pharmaceutical companies are really to serve one purpose and that's to help accelerate uh, new treatments uh, for FOP. Uh, just to ensure there's no uh, conflicting interests, we've uh, developed and published a guideline for our engagement uh, with our industry partners. Uh, we just updated the guideline, as you can see, uh, uh, last year in March. Uh, this guideline can be found and downloaded uh, from our IFOPA uh, website. So the IFOPA has also helped to organize a meeting with FDA called the FDA Listening Session. Uh, last year in May, uh, 12 members from the FOP community, along with uh, IFOPA, we uh, traveled down to Bethesda, Maryland to uh, participate in uh, this meeting. And we were able to share with FDA what it's like <clears throat> to live with FOP. In FDA's words, it's very easy for them to read about these diseases, but it's not always possible to hear directly from patients. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you can see uh, some of the topics uh, that we covered were uh, quite uh, wide. Uh, we covered everything from diagnosis uh, to the impact on uh, family uh, members and also the need for FOP uh, treatments. I'd say this was a uh, successful meeting uh, with really fantastic participation from FDA. Uh, we had 15 different FDA divisions, uh, not people, but divisions uh, actually participate in this meeting. And if you would like to read more about the meeting, you can actually review our summary uh, by downloading a copy of the <coughs> meeting summary either on the FDA or IFPA website. Uh, as you can see uh, here um, by the number of uh, summaries, uh, we were lucky enough to have been just one of a few diseases to participate in these uh, sessions with uh, FDA. Um, <clears throat> so uh, finally, the IFOPA also provides educational support uh, covering a variety of topics. Uh, we recently developed two videos that uh, help to explain drug development and one video to explain clinical trials. Uh, I thought we would, uh, on uh, Rare Disease Day, we'd share one of these videos just to highlight some of the educational uh, work that we're doing. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is, it's gonna be a little bit jerky, but I'm going to uh, stop sharing my presentation and uh, uh, switch over uh, to our, um, our YouTube channel just to uh, show you one of our videos. So bear with me with just one second. The IFOPA presents the drug development journey for FOP. Everyone living with FOP wants a cure, but how do we find it? Discovering medicines to treat a genetic disease or condition like FOP is a long journey. It can take many years to understand a disease. It takes even more time to make sure a potential medicine is safe and works before it becomes a treatment your doctor can give you. Why does it take so long? Let's take a look. Researchers study conditions like FOP and search for medicines that might improve or stop the symptoms. They experiment with those medicines in a lab to test out their ideas. If the lab research goes well, it's time to see how the medicine works in people by starting a clinical trial. At this point, there are many unknowns about the study medicine. It will go through many steps called clinical trial phases so more can be learned about the study medicine. From start to finish, patient safety is watched closely. 
Usually, the first clinical trial phase is with healthy volunteers. The next phase includes volunteers with FOP. Researchers are trying to learn, is the medicine safe? Does it improve or stop symptoms? How much is needed? Are there side effects? If so, can they be managed? Finally, regulatory groups decide if the study medicine should be approved and made available to patients. Our FOP community needs more treatment options and a cure. To get there, we need more volunteers to join clinical trials. It's a long journey. But the day we can stop FOP in its tracks is a day we will celebrate together. Until then, talk to your doctor about clinical trials and learn more at ifopa.org. Okay. Just going to uh, switch back. So hope you uh, enjoyed that video. We also have uh, another uh, video on clinical trials. Uh, there's a great... Um, uh, video also on uh, for uh, families on FOP, uh, which is available on our YouTube channel. And this is just a, really an example of uh, some of the content that we've been developing. Um, <clears throat> we feel it's important to uh, educate the community about the drug development process, about clinical trials, and really prepare our community for the next phase of uh, our um, of FOP. Uh, we've also been, uh, just a quick note, we've also been revamping our website on clinical trials. Uh, admittedly, it's uh, 95 to 98% already, but given the fact uh, that uh, there could be some important information about clinical trials, I did want to share the link, which you can see here. Uh, you can also uh, email me at uh, Adam Sherman, uh, Adam period Sherman at ifopa.org. Um, if you'd like the link, but uh, this uh, contains some uh, great information, not only on specific clinical trials, uh, but also just background information, information you should, in, uh, uh, should be asking yourselves and your physicians if you're interested in participating in uh, clinical trials for FLP. So uh, that takes us through the prepared uh, section of our webinar. Uh, I hope this provides just a little bit of color on how the IFOPA uh, supports research. Uh, as mentioned, I'd like to make this uh, more interactive. Uh, so uh, please uh, submit any questions that you have at this stage uh, to Michelle and we'll uh, try to address them. So uh, thank you. Okay, so thank you so much, Adam. Um, we do have a couple of questions. So I will start with the first one. Does the IFOPA encourage or support FOP researchers to publish in open access journals or to pay open access fees in mixed open access traditional journals? Uh, so we, we don't have an official opinion on that. Um, in the ideal world, open access journals uh, should be uh, paid for. I know, uh, depending on the journal, there's an additional fee. Uh, sometimes the investigators do not have uh, the money to support that fee. Um, but in, in the ideal world, yes, having open access so all people, that just means uh, for people are aware that uh, you can actually download uh, the, the copy of the publication. And so in an ideal world, the answer is yes. Uh, the registry manuscript uh, that we uh, just uh, highlighted before is open access. Uh, anyone can download it. Uh, where possible, we make um, uh, publications uh, available to everybody for download. Um, if you uh, are having trouble uh, gaining access, you can email me and we can help you uh, try to obtain a uh, copy. There is another question about the, um, what strategies is the IFOPA working on with clinical researchers to describe decrease the length of clinical trials and the number of patients needed? Uh, great, great question, uh, insightful question. Um, so uh, a couple things. Um, one is uh, registry. Uh, the more we know about the disease, uh, the more we can design more um, targeted uh, clinical trials and uh, get the population just right uh, for the question that's being asked in the clinical trial. Uh, we're also, uh, as mentioned, uh, supporting uh, the FOP Biomarker Consortium. Uh, having a uh, valid biomarker can help researchers better understand different populations of FOP that can then uh, be entered in clinical trials. 
uh, if we, in the future, if we are successful and we are able to identify a valid biomarker, uh, this can also be used um, in uh, clinical trials as an endpoint. And just so you're aware, uh, biomarkers can also be imaging. Uh, um, so having uh, things that measure bone volume in a valid way, <clears throat> correlating it with clinical outcomes um, can also reduce uh, clinical trials. And just a last point, we are working on this year on a new tool, uh, patient reported outcomes tool that will measure symptoms. Um, we hope uh, to get this to become a validated uh, tool that's available to uh, all pharmaceutical companies uh, so that they can use it in their clinical trial and begin to understand how their uh, drugs are impacting not just the bone growth, but also the symptoms that uh, many people with the FOP are uh, facing. Good question. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, it looks like there aren't any other questions at this time. As Adam said, you can always submit a question to him at Adam dot sherman at ifopa.org. You can also submit questions to together at ifopa.org. It's been amazing to see the way that our research work has grown in the last several years. And that is truly because we have such a committed group of academic and pharmaceutical researchers and clinicians that are willing to come together with the IFOPA to really help us develop these tools and resources. But it would not be possible, no matter what we develop, it wouldn't be possible without the funding that, meant that our donors who are, and our fundraisers provide, but also just the willingness of our families to participate in the registry and the biobank and um, these other research programs. So we're grateful to each of you for the role that you play. I know we have people on the call today from around the world. Um, some families, some researchers, um, some people from pharmaceutical companies. So we could not do this without you. And on Rare Disease Day, we're just grateful um, for the role that each of you play in helping the IFOPA um, move to the place where hopefully soon we will be one of those diseases that has an approved treatment. So Adam, I'll turn it back over to you to close out. Yeah, so uh, I'll echo uh, what Michelle just said. We, we have a terrific uh, support um, from industry, uh, from our researchers. Uh, it's a collaborative group and I, I think working together, there's power in numbers. And uh, we, we just have the most supportive uh, FOP community I could ever imagine. And I'm just appreciative of uh, everyone's involvement. So uh, thank you to you and I'll just say, uh, wish you a very happy Rare Disease Day and uh, a very healthy 2020. So thank you. <laughs>